so thanks for inviting me. And um, feel free to ask questions whenever they come up. Um, so I guess Jeff suggested that I kind of start out by giving, which is lucky because that's what my talk is going to do, start out by giving kind of some high-level uh, view on what kind of extol the virtues of category theory and say what's useful about it, and then at some point get to, um, get to some uh, kind of a primer, as you said it. So, so the main thing I want to say that category theory is good for is, is it's kind of the math of interconnection or composition. So you have a bunch of people working at different sections of the Broad or different parts of the world, and they're all kind of working in their own language. And so category theory is kind of a story of different interacting entities, each with their own language that needs some way of talking and composing together to be a larger whole. So um, just like humans interact with machines and companies interact with companies, databases interact with applications, and everything's interacting, and that interaction is what kind of makes everything work. Um, but every entity, like my own brain, has some kind of connection. My own way of speaking to myself uh, is optimized for being me, and yours is optimized for being you, and we're able to communicate because we find some way of doing that and formalize some rules about how we're going to do it. And those rules can change, and the rules for me and you might be different than the rules for him and her. So uh, we're trying to successfully transfer information through an interaction and category theory is trying to do that within math, at least. It's been successful at communicating between different areas of math, and I'm proposing it's also useful for communicating between different uh, areas of, of society or any place where you're using formal, semi-formal or formal languages. Um, but a database itself is a language, so that's kind of one place to start this. And the way a database is a language is if you have a database, you know that this table is for putting this kind of information, and that table is for putting that kind of language, uh, information, and this column means that kind of information. So it's a language about first name, you know, the various things. Uh, I think that's more or less clear. Um, so when you want to talk about exchanging information between entities, you could kind of just ground your discussion on formalizing how two databases would interact. So I don't know if this is a problem at the Broad, but it's a problem commonly in commerce that um, you may have several databases all here, but they don't work well together, and someone actually has to kind of to integrate those databases. There is actually some a lot of work to be done, and it's not an easy task. So uh, a lot of this talk is kind of about how um, you would connect, you would do database integration or information integration using a category theory uh, framework. So I don't know which of these words are known to people, but if uh, so data management is in some sense a simple idea. It's a translation of information from one form to another. Um, there's something called an extract, transform, load process where you kind of move database, data to a warehouse somewhere uh, for easy querying later. So you know it's, you want to, it's easy to put it in in one form. It's easy to write to your database in one form and easy to read in another form, and that process is a translation from one information form to another. Um, data migration means you have two different databases and you're trying to move the data. It's a pretty similar to ETL process. But even a query is a translation of information from one form to another, where you have it in one big form, namely your database, and you want it in this other form, namely this tiny little table, and you throw away tons and tons of stuff and you do some, do some work, but at the end you get data in a different form that you wanted. You lose a lot because um, you don't care about most of the data in your database, but you have it in some other form now. And when you uh, do an update, you're also changing the database. You're, changing, you're translating information from what you had before to what you have now by either adding a row or changing every row who's John Smith. You're adding five to his salary or whatever. So, um, so category theory can simplify. There, oh, there's a fundamental connection between databases and categories. In some sense, there's a way of seeing them as very similar types of, of categories as kind of a, a, a mathematical way of thinking about databases, um, kind of natively almost, or pretty directly. Um, and so by looking at how we think about category theory and databases and seeing that connection, it can help you if you know databases to learn about category theory, if you know category theory to learn about databases. And you can see kind of how different parts will fit together and we can bring powerful theorems from, from math into database problems. 
Um, so today, relational databases work really well, and they're very reliable and scalable. But, um, but I want to make a distinction between the relational database system you use and the one that's actually the formal system that it's based on. It's the one people use is not so much is not that close to the relational algebra form that people write about in books. First of all, um, tables can have duplicates. It, uh, nulls can appear. Um, updates can, uh, are outside the model of relational databases. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really fit the, the relational, um, sorry, I, it does occur in relational databases. It doesn't occur in the relational algebra or relational calculus formalism. So I think uh, to talk about the theory correctly, like the theory of relations is really old, and, and Cod's version from the 70s uh, was based on the theory of relations. And I think that today's databases are better I would argue we're better uh, uh, formalized using category theory, where foreign keys are, and I don't know how, much, how many of these words are, are well known to all of you guys, but foreign keys and updates and schema mappings and distributed databases and things like that make more sense, I think, from a category theoretic point of view. Um, so I think I'll skip this slide. Um, so I want to say what category theory is. I said before it's kind of the, the story of the mathematical story of handing off information from one one entity to another or a composition, putting lots of things together to form a, a larger structure. But but just on a from mathematical point of view, um, since it was invented in the forties, it's kind of revolutionized math, I would say. So more and more parts of math are taught are, are kind of are formalized or founded or modern papers can't even be written without category theory. So um, maybe uh, uh, Jeff was saying that, um, you know, if you're, so I've talked to someone from Verizon who's using, they use Scala and a category theoretic version of Scala, uh, like that kind of side of the story. And they're using it more and more. They're using natural transformations and functors and all these words that are category theory words. And now the code base probably can't move back to a point where it didn't use those words because they're just part of the story now and just makes things easier. It kind of condenses large, you know, makes your code easier to read and stuff like that. And in math also the same thing. People might not think category theory is important, but they recognize how it condenses uh, and makes more convenient um, the things that they want to say. And so modern papers in most parts of mathematics, apart from, say, applied math and PDEs, and combinatorics, maybe, partial differential equations. But for most of pure math, uh, a lot of is written in category theory language and couldn't be written without it. And it's been proposed as a foundation for mathematics. And I guess what I'm really trying to say here is that category theory isn't going away. It's becoming very popular. Um, but I don't think it's at all a, a fad. I think it is really kind of, at least in mathematics, it's certainly not a fad. It's just kind of taking over. And I think it's going to be... Um, uh, it's kind of the uh, algebraic part of the story that's kind of con so we have like the machine learning thing that that's not going away like we are going to have machine learning forever I think category theory is kind of the opposite side of the story where instead of things working and you kind of don't know why what you don't really know what it's doing the explanation isn't there category theory is more like the explanatory pieces of the puzzle that puts uh, puts that first and foremost so so it, I guess I would say like machine learning is to perception as category theory is to um, uh, it. Uh, what's the other word? Um, perception versus uh, yeah. reasoning, I guess. It's more like the reasoning part. So it's been branching out also into physics, linguistics, material science. Um, of course, computer science has been really popular. Um, so. How will it connect to databases? Um, basically, categories and database schemas are doing the same thing. And that is that a schema gives you a, a framework for modeling a situation. You've got some tables and some attributes. And that's exactly what a category does. It has something called objects and arrows. And objects are to tables as arrows are to attributes. So. Um, there are many possible category theoretic models of databases, but the, the power of category theory is it 
having lots of different versions of something is not a problem because you can connect those different versions to each other with what's called functors. So a functor is a way of connecting one category, one way of seeing the world or one worldview um, to another. So I'll talk about something called the functorial data model of, which is a category theoretic way of looking at databases. And basically, if you say schema and finite categories are the same things, if you just declared that, then I would just start telling you how to look at these two uh, things as, as the same. So, so here's a little picture. You have objects or entities, like employee and department, and you have arrows or foreign keys connecting them. Like maybe every employee ha is in a department, and every department has a secretary who's an employee, or a manager who's an employee. Um, but there's also something called the category of categories. Categories are, the objects of a category are like entities, and the morphisms of a category are like interactions between entities or translations from one to another. But you can think of a whole category, which is a whole space of entities, as one entity, and another whole category or space of entities as another entity, and start looking at morphisms between those guys and how to translate uh, between those. And so every finite category acts as a database schema, where inside the entities are the tables and the arrows, the morphisms are the, um, are the columns connecting one table to another. But in fact, there's also a category of all categories where the objects are whole database schemas and the morphisms are connectors between database schemas. So in the rest of the talk, I'll try to give kind of a more, uh, more actual mathematical way of talking about all this stuff, show you the math, and uh, the tight connection between categories and databases. And I'll talk about schema, uh, schema evolution and querying and migrating data. And I don't know how much time exactly we have, but um, time permitting, we'll talk about a connection to programming language theory, uh, which would kind of get closer to Haskell and Scala and things like that. And there's also something people talk about called uh, the resource descriptive framework, the guys at W3C. Um, uh, it's supposed to be this unstructured way of talking about data in terms of triples or a triple store, like um, Bob, uh, first, one, oh, employee 101, first name Bob, employee 101, last name Smith. These are triples, and you can encode a lot of information in triples. And we'll talk about how these RDF triples, uh, how you can kind of get an RDF database from a, a categorical database. So let me say what a category is. Um, this isn't the usual definition of a category, but I'm gonna give you one that's equivalent. And by equivalent, category theory has something called an equivalence of categories. And the type of categories I'm giving you is equivalent to category theory to the usual definition of categories. So you can just throw that sentence away if you didn't understand. <laughs> so what is a category? It models entities of a certain sort and relationships between them. So here's a picture of a whole category. This category has five objects, A, B, C, D, E, and it has lots of uh, arrows, F, G, H, I, J, K. Um, so you can think of this as a graph, and you can in fact think of any category as a graph. So maybe I should make the connection to Scala or um, Haskell or something. There the objects would be data types, string, int, um, string times int, bool, whatever. And the arrows would be, uh, would be programs. So any program that takes a string and returns an int would be an arrow from string to int, int being integer. Um, so in, in the category of data types, you would have infinitely many different data types that are possible, and you'd have infinitely many different programs that are possible, um, but, but that still forms an infinite graph. You'd never want to draw that graph, but it's still a graph in the sense you can think of it as objects and arrows, or vertices, vertices and arrows. But a category is more than just a graph. It's a graph plus one extra piece of information, which is the ability to declare two different paths through the path to, two different paths through the graph to be equivalent. So if you write down a graph and you declare what you want to be equivalent to what, you've given a category. 
you could say, I only want a path to be equivalent to itself. You've given a category. It's just the original graph in some sense. But you could also say something like um, fg is the same thing as fh, even though g is different than h. So uh, I'll, I think I'm going to give an example of semantically where that might come up in a second. But I could say that um, jk is the same thing as iii for some reason. Those two paths are the same. I just declare them to be equivalent. And once I make these two declarations with this graph, I've completely defined a, a category. So how does that come up in Scala? You might say that um, A times B plus C equals A times B plus A times C. And that's the distributive law for integers, say. And that's um, two different paths from int times int times int to int. Given three integers, A, B, and C, you can either go this way or you can go that way and you get the same answer. And so it, knowing in your code that one program would equal another um, would be the knowledge of the, these kind of declared, declared equivalence relations between paths through programming space. So let me try to, here's the example. So suppose you had a table full of self emails. I send myself emails. Um, and you have a table full of emails, and you have a table full of people. So every email goes from a person to a person, and every e self-email is an email. But even though for an email, for a given email, it's not the case that the person it's from is equal to the person it's to, it is true if you start back here at self-emails. So, so if you had a table full of these, and you checked the from and the to, you would see that they were the same person by definition of self-email. So imagine a database schema where you have a table, table for every dot and you have a column that connects you from the table full of self emails to the table full of emails and two columns on email that give you two different people. You have this table of emails and in there you have like the, when it was sent and then who it went to and who it was from. Um, then this information, this extra, e this extra information that these two paths are equivalent tightens up your database a little bit. It gives you, um, it makes it more, uh, um, well, it's a constraint that you can tell when you violate. So it, it kind of makes it more readable to someone new coming in, say. They can tell, like, what is the self email? Oh, it's someone who it's from and to the same person. OK, so I've heard it said that math is the art of getting organized. So what organizes math? I think after thousands of years, people realized, because I, I, I think category theory is, um, uh, all that's coming to mind is the bee's knees. So I think the category theory is really great. So, um, so I think that we finally realized where we're supposed to be. And it, it wasn't set theory. It was category theory. Um, and that there are these common features that exist throughout mathematics, and they're objects, arrows, paths, and path equivalences. Or really, people, you should, I mean, in category theory, we'd say objects, morphisms, and compositions. Um, or let's say primary keys, foreign keys, and path equations. So let me just give the definition of a category. This isn't the one you'll usually see, but this is equivalent, and it's more database C. So a category consists of some things and some rules. And the things or constituents are, it has a set of objects, maybe the set of all programming, maybe the set of all data types in your programming language, string, int. Um, I'll draw those like this. So string, int, bool, string times int, whatever. And it has a set of arrows. And every arrow has a source object and a target object. So you would have a whole bunch of arrows, and each one you could extract two different objects from it, its source and its target. So if, if I had that the source of f was x and this target of f was y, I would draw f like this. And a path in C is a finite head-to-tail sequence of arrows, like this one. Just draw a bunch of arrows in a row. But I'm also... By finite, I mean any natural number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, even 0. So even 1, this is a path of length 2. A path of length 1 is just an arrow. And a path of length 0 would never get started, but it is, a, it is a vertex. So a path of length 0 is a vertex. And the last thing you need for a category besides objects, arrows, um, is a notion of equivalence for paths. 
Once you have those three things, you've decided on your category as long as your things work right. So what does it mean to work right? Um, you have to follow the rules, and that is that you can, you've already declared when two different paths are equivalent, but their sources have to be equivalent, have to be the same object for that to be possible. You can't have two different paths that are equal when they start at different points or they end at different points. So first of all, two equal paths have to have the same starting point and the same ending point. And, and the third thing you need is that if you declare this gigantic path to equal that gigantic path, P to equal Q from B to C, then if someone, if you extend it a bit by adding M on the left, or extend it a bit by adding N on the right, then you have to declare that that longer path is also equal. That, those pairs of longer paths. That doesn't violate the thing I said about self-email because I didn't declare that the, the sender and the uh, recipient were the same person and then get that self-email satisfied something. It was the other way around. So that one said that, um, so, so the, the, the example I gave before would be a category with those, those three elements, three objects, self-email, email, and person, and those various arrows um, is from and to something like that, is sender and receiver. So that's all you need for a category. In the category of, I think, I think I'll probably say this later, but I'll say it now just in case, to ground it in Scala, because that's when I'm just assuming that's our, our best um, uh, interface is through Scala. So if you have a bunch of, if you have a graph where the vertices are data types and the and the edges are, um, are programs that take you from a data type to another data type, then you can declare when two paths are equal. They're equal when, so what is a path? It means do this program, then this program, then this program. A path of length zero is the identity function on a program. It's an identity program that takes you from the data type string to itself. And so that's what a path is. And you would declare two paths to be equivalent if for any input value they would give you the same output value. Because if you have a path of programs, you can combine them into one big program. So you can declare when you can, you would have a category because you could tell when two different paths through programming space were equal by checking them on every possible input, which uh, because that's impossible to check, the category is more of an abstraction in that case than something real, than something that you can, you would physically, uh, that, that that's formal, I guess, but, um, or, or that it's actually being used. But in a database context, we actually use the category. So what does equivalence of path mean? So an arrow is going to represent a foreign key in our database. So now I'm moving from the Scala point of view to the database point of view. <coughs> Again, we're going to have objects and arrows, but there the objects will represent tables, and the arrows will represent a foreign key that takes you from one table to another. And so that's like you have a, you have a table of all <coughs> departments, and you have a table of all employees, and when you look at what department an employee works in, you get this code. You look in this other table, and you see that code in the ID column for, for the department that they're in. So the arrows are going to represent these foreign keys. And when we follow a path, we just take a, a record in table A and follow it through these foreign keys until we land in, in, ta in table B. And we declare two paths equivalent for the same reason we do, I said we would in Scala, I guess which would be if for any row of table A, if you follow path P and you follow path Q, you land at the same row of table B. So, in a, yeah, in typical database practices, at least so much I've heard, um, equivalent paths are actually avoided because uh, it's a constraint that looks like it should be there but can't be enforced or isn't enforced and therefore causes problems. Um, people will think two queries are equivalent and they're not. And so because of that, they actually cut one of the paths and don't allow one of the foreign keys to exist. Um, it's, it's considered good design, but I, I've heard it often cause, is, is a pain in the neck. And so category theory has the concept of equivalent paths built in, so that constraint is actually enforced rather than like appearing to be there but not enforced. So I kind of talked about, or I talked about Scala as a category, but there's also the category of sets. And the category of sets is kind of my intuition for what Scala is. 
So if you were ever going to look for trying to understand Scala or Haskell or something in terms of, of um, category theory, there's tons of stuff written about that. But if you wanted to see what the mathematicians would say, you would probably, your first thing you might try would be to go look at the category of sets and understand that. Um, it's not quite the same because th there are some differences between types in programming languages and set and sets, but, uh, but there's enough similarity that if you ever wanted to study the category of sets, uh, it would give you a lot of intuition about um, these programming language categories. So here I see two big bubbles, A and B, and each one contains some dots, and I see some arrows. But note that everything in table A has an arrow coming out of it, and it has exactly one arrow coming out of it, and that's called a function. So I would represent this whole picture in the category of sets by two dots, one for A and one for B, and one arrow, F, between them. So uh, thinking from a um, Scala point of view, or I hope, there should be something called an enum type, I might hope, uh, maybe. <laughs> Um, if there was something called an enum type, or you could say what, it, what I, you could understand what I meant, this would be one type in your programming language. This would be another type in your programming language, and this would be a function between them. Or from a database point of view, this would be a table full of four things, four rows, and this would be a table full of four rows, and I'd have a foreign key between them. But in the category of sets, this just makes sense. In any book on where it talked about the category of sets, they could easily have a picture like this, and. Um, the objects represent sets, the arrows represent functions, a path represents a sequence of composable functions, and two paths are equivalent if they have the same composition. Um, so here's a totally different category, the ca and every ordered set is a category. So uh, an ordered set is a, a set together with a notion of when one thing is less than another, like the real numbers or the rational numbers or um, the hierarchy of a company. <laughs> So if you have a hierarchy of a company, everyone is, is less than or equal to themselves. And if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. And that's also true in, in the real numbers. So you can turn any ordered set into a category where the objects of that category be become the elements of your set. So all the people in the company say. And you have an arrow if one person is uh, under another person or reports to another person. And there's no arrows if they don't report. And in that case, then the, the paths would turn into, um, you would say that every two paths are equivalent. So I guess in a company, it's not good practice to be under two different people, but it can happen uh, in some informal ways or whatever. Uh, but, but whatever the case may be, your D is on, I get in a post set at least, if you're thinking of this as a post set, you would have to say that D is under E in only one way. Those two paths are equivalent. So you turn something into a po you turn a post set into a category by declaring every two paths that can be equivalent to be equivalent. If they start and end at the same place, they're equivalent. Then all you really know when to evaluate whether one thing is less than another, you just ask, is there a path from one to the other? And that's how you go from an ordered set to a category and from a category with this from a category to an ordered set. You just ask, is there a path from one to another? Um, or from a database point of view, you could say like A is less than or equal to C, mean A has fewer accessors than B. A, table A is, can only be accessed by fewer people than table B, or a, a subset of the people. So functors are mappings between categories, and I think the word functor comes up in programming languages like Haskell or um, Scala um, as a functor from the category to itself. So whenever you see the word functor in Scala, I'm guessing it's a functor from a category to that category. You're in the category of data types and programs, and you get a data type or a program. You plug a data type in, you get a data type out. You plug a program in, you get a program out. That's what a functor is. Whereas in, in category theory, it's between any two categories, whether they be the same one or not. So it's, it's like a graph mapping that's required to respect equivalence relations between paths. So a functor from one category to another, um, using the definition of category I gave before as this kind of path, uh, as this graph with path equivalences, is that every dot in C has to be assigned one dot in D, and every arrow in C can be assigned a whole path in D, a sequence of arrows in D. 
So a graph homomorphism sends arrows to arrows. A functor can send arrows to paths. In a place like Scala, in a, in a category like Scala, every path has a unique arrow associated to it. So you don't really need to see the difference so much. But this functor needs to respect sources and targets and needs to respect equivalences of paths. Um, and so databases are going to be categories with functors to set. There's a category of sets, which I talked about before. And a database in this talk will be a category, like this one, and a functor from that category to set, to the category of sets. So if you have a category that looks like this, it says that I have three tables, A, B, and C, and two foreign keys, <coughs> F and G. But it doesn't tell you what's in those things yet, in those tables. It's just like the table headers. Um, now you want to fill those tables with data, then you assign to every table a set, a set of rows. And you assign to every uh, column, foreign key column, you assign a function that takes you from a row in table A to a row in table B. And once you assign to every object a set and to every morphism a function, um, you can ask whether two different paths are equivalent or not, and that would say that as I said before, if you follow foreign keys, you get the same place. You, you know, at a, starting in a given row, you follow foreign keys through path P, you follow foreign keys through path Q, you get the same row in the target table. So that's the, that's the basic idea, is that the schema is telling you what the tables are and how they're connected, and the data is, fill, is turning each one of those tables into a set, a set of rows, and each arrow into, a foreign, into kind of the foreign key relationship. Okay, so maybe this should have come before all the talk talking I've been doing, but what is a database? It's rows, it, it's got a bunch of tables and it's got a bunch of relationships, and every table has a bunch of rows that are called records or tuples, and the columns can be called attributes. Or, but these attributes, these columns, can either be a pure data or a, a foreign key or a key. So uh, a table can have foreign key columns that are connected to other tables, and it links a, table, a column of A into the primary key of B. And a schema can also have business rules. And that's what I'm saying. Here's a picture of a, of a little tiny database and um, what's going on here. Every table, I'm going to assume, has an ID column. And then it's got some data columns, like first name and last name. Every employee has a first name and last name. And it's got some foreign keys, like every employee has a manager. The manager of 101 is 103, who's Alan Turing, whereas the manager of Bertrand Russell is himself uh, for some reason. And, um, and every, t every employee is in an apartment, so David Hilbert's in department sales, I guess, for some reason. And the secretary of sales is, lo and behold, David Hilbert, whereas uh, Alan Turing is also in sales, but the secretary of that is still David Hilbert. So these are some foreign key columns, manager, department, and secretary. And we could add some integrity constraints or business rules that says that in my database, uh, the manager of an employee must be in the same department as that employee. Um, that tends to like not really work well in practice because the CEO might be considered the boss of everybody, but he's not, he or she's not in the same department as everyone. But um, you could maybe make an easier one that says the secretary of a department must be in that department. Whatever your rules are, um, these two rules at least, and a lot of rules that people would want to make are, uh, path, are path equations. So we'll just, we'll just focus on those today. So um, theoretically, we can even consider these, these first and last name and the name of a department, those columns, we can even theoretically consider those as tables, as foreign keys. And how so? You could have a, an infinite list of strings and just consider that to be a one-column table, infinite list of integers as a one-column table. And if you do that, if you make that abstraction, then, even, then every table, every column here becomes a foreign key column. Even this one is just a foreign key that links you into the string table. So in practice, that's not how... So I, I have a database integration company. And that's not how we actually do these things. We don't actually consider these foreign keys to an uh, infinite table. We, but we treat them very similarly to that. We treat them as maps to, um, or foreign keys in some sense, to the programming language itself. 
So this first name column hooks into Scala, or Java in our case, as string. And this one also as string. Um, so, but now every column in here is just a function that takes you from 101, 102, 103 to some other set. The set of all strings, the set of all strings, the set of all employees, the set of all departments. And so what we're getting is that every column in the table is a key. You have the primary key column and the rest born key columns. So in a, in a picture like this with three tables, this would be the schema. And it's also a category. Um, so the objects are employee, department, string, and string, I guess. And the, I think I should just make these all the same string, but I, I didn't in this picture. And so you, every employee has a manager, every employee has a department, every department has a secretary, <coughs> etc. And so you can just follow these foreign keys around and ask for the employees, departments, secretaries, managers, last name. Um, these are kind of queries, but they're actually just given by following foreign keys or paths through the database. So, uh, I don't, oh, and, and here are these two equivalent relations. And so now you see a, a graph with two equivalent relations. So this is a category, but it's, this category is completely describing how the data is allowed to be in this database. So I want, I, I guess the main point of this talk is to say that, um, is to show that there's this nice relationship between these two worlds. Because maybe you're, you're used to thinking about category theory and, or you'd like to think more about category theory and um, Scala, I don't know. But uh, you can also think be about category theory and databases. Do you have a question? Well, I don't want to open up a whole new topic, but yeah. where does a transaction fit in this model? Right, so a transaction like an update is, let's say, is generally going to be a functor from the data from the data itself to the data itself. So, given um, if you uh, if you let's say you do insert only, and it's easier to then it's then what I'm saying is true. <laughs> um, so, insert only databases are are pretty nice because you can by by in, involving like transaction time and stuff like that, you can act, you can add to your database a mark for deletion. And it's kind of a more, um, it works a little better, or a, val a new valid time for your data. It works a little better than deleting. So it also works better category theoretically if, if you have insert only, where you can just add information to your database, like I have deleted this row now. Um, or this row, uh, it can be more useful, both from an auditing purpose for your database itself, uh, because you might want to look back in time to what was happening a while ago, and from a category theoretic point of view. In that case, it's a functor from the category of instances to itself. Given any instance, you can update it and get a new instance. And if one instance is contained in another, then after this insert, the bigger one will be still contained, the smaller one. OK, so I think I've said this pretty clearly. Um, so a functor from this category to the category of sets assigns to each object a set, of, a set the set of employees, the set of strings, a set of departments. It assigns a function to every arrow. It assigns equivalent functions to paths that were declared equivalent. And so that is exactly the data. This, this, the, category of all way, the category of all functors from this to set is the category of all instances or database states on your schema. Um, OK. But we can also talk about functors between schemas, because a schema is like a custom category. In category theory, in math, you have like these kind of crystalline, perfect categories, like the category of all sets, or the category of all monoids, or the category of all groups, or vector spaces. And they're kind of perfect in some way, because mathematicians like to study perfect things. Um, but in a real world company, you don't have a perfect database, you have just something that you're using and you might change it later. And you're not asking for it to be perfect. And so it's kind of a custom category with 37 objects and 42 arrows and some path equivalences. Um, but whatever your custom category is, the data you have in it is a functor from that category to the category of sets. But you can also talk about functors between schemas, just like you can talk about a functor from Scala to itself, um, which is what is typically called a functor, I think, in, in programming languages. 
And these allow you to kind of move data between schemas. Um, you can change the schema. Um, and in this way, you can kind of manage the change. You can watch how the, we're gonna sh I'm gonna show how, um, if you have a functor between schemas, you can move data between them through that functor. And knowing how you got your data, because I moved it from this schema through the, to this other schema, using this functor, it gives you a, a notion of provenance that tells you where the data you have now came from. So um, if you evolve your schema from one schema to another, you might have a bunch of arrows that take you over time from schema C0 to schema CN. And you want to migrate data from your old schema to your new schema and have it, you know, you want to evolve. So someone was talking, people often these days talk about schema-less databases. And a friend of mine um, says, we don't need schema-less, we need schema-more. So we want to make it easier to build schemas so that it's not such a pain in the such a pain in the neck to build a schema, you want to be able to kind of say, oh, I need to add a column, I need to add this, I need to do this. Make your own custom schema. It's no longer connected to everything else, but you know, but it is, in fact, because by doing those additions, you just made a functor from your old schema to your new schema. If having, a, because you've added some new columns, new, some, some new objects and new arrows. And so if you have a functor from an old schema to a new schema, and if it was easy to move data back and forth, then the computer could just watch what you did, see that you added new objects, new arrows, have a functor there sitting, sitting there, and then if we have a way of moving data back and forth between them, it can just automate that process. Um, now, whether that works exactly as planned, we would need to kind of see some examples uh, of how of how that want to be, how you want to use that. But um, theoretically, there is this connection that could be used, and we so we want all this to work as it should and. So we do have theorems about the way this is going to work, and, and I guess we'll talk about those next. So if you have two functors, you can compose them. You can take objects in C to objects in D, and objects in D to objects in E, and you can compose the arrows. I mean, you can move objects and arrows from C to E, and so you can concatenate functors together. Um, I don't know how long I should, what's the good ending time? We have the room until nine, or one. <laughs> we don't have that long. Uh, no, we have the room until one, uh, okay. so it's really, if you like, if people have questions or if you wanted to go straight to one, it's kind of up to the crowd and yourself. I feel like I've been talking a long time, but I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to bore people or not. But um, So I guess maybe I'll just go another, I'll try to go another um, few minutes. Sure, that sounds good. Okay, so yeah, so, I guess I wouldn't have really wanted to talk about, um, so what, what happens is for any functor from C to D, we could call that a schema mapping. We can canonically transfer data from C to data on D and vice versa. So given this functor between two schemas, we can functorially move C instances to D instances. This is a functor, this is a functor. Um, it means we're going to be able to assign every instance of C an instance of D, and every morphism of instance of provenance between two different instances that are compared. Uh, we can convert that into something, the same sort of thing on D. Um, so one sort of migration, there's a data migration functor associated to this functor from C to D. If you have a schema and I have a schema, since I'm David, I'll be D. Um, then if we have a functor from C to D, and if I have some instance, that's just a functor from D to set. Then I can compose those and get a functor for you from C to set by just composing. So it's very easy to see how with this kind of schema as category, data as functor, schema migration, or schema mapping as functor, how you can move data around from, from if I have data, you get data. That's, a, that's going to be a functor. It's a functor from D instances to C instances. But this functor has, moreover, this functor has something called an adjoint, or actually has two adjoints. And I wouldn't have mentioned that word, except maybe I was going to. Um, yes, I was. Uh, so every, some functors have special partners that go the other way that are called adjoints. And apparently this is something that people in the Scala community, as of, at, like at, three days ago. As of three days ago, are beginning to talk about from that point of view. Um, so I, I'm just trying to, I guess one major point of this talk is to say that there's a strong connection between these two worlds of category theory and databases, and th that the point for you 
could be that if you ever wanted to learn category theory, you could think about databases and get some intuition there. So if you wanted to think about adjoints, you know, in 10 years from now, because you, were, you felt like you're ready uh, or wanted to, then there, there may be that databases could give you kind of a, a, a way of thinking about what that would mean. To us, in this talk, it's that given the functor from D instance to C instance that takes my data and gives you data, um, it has two adjoints to take data from you and give them give data to me. And it turns out that delta, that this delta thing I told you about before, um, corresponds to a kind of projection of databases. Like you can throw away tables or throw away columns. And its adjoints correspond to union and joins. So typical database operations that you're used to, like unioning tables together or joining tables along a common column, uh, turn out to be the adjoints to the functor I told you about before. And what that means is that adjoints exist throughout category theory. They're one of the most important aspects of category theory. And it turns out that in the special case of databases, if you just follow your nose about what a database might be and look at uh, from a category theory theoretic perspective, um, you find important notions in databases popping out of these notions that people consider to be important throughout math, namely adjoints. We see unions and joins popping out in this context, and that's what makes them so special, adjoints in, in, in mathematics, is that where, wherever we are, when we find an adjoint, we tend to find it pleasing, like, oh, that was supposed to be there, and you found it as an adjoint. And so that's, um, yeah, so the, there's an adjoint called pi, which kind of takes data, and I mean, this picture is going to be useless in but we can move data from schema C to schema D by kind of joining along first and last name or by unioning. We can either join T1 and T2 and, and throw the information into you, or we can union T1 and T2 and join, put the information into you. If we join, um, we're going to get all T1, T2 pairs that have the same first and last name. And if they have the same first and last name, we can just read off their social security number and salary. Whereas if we union, what category theory just tells you to do is that you put the union of T1 and T2 in there, and if someone asks for the SSN, um, if it came from T1, you know it. If it comes from T2, you put a null, a labeled null. So that's just what category theory thinks is the best solution to that problem. So I think I will say the time is not good and not talk about programming languages, which I kind of have throughout. Uh, and nor RDF, and I guess I'll just stop there and ask for questions. Thanks.